A very good evening to all our viewers. Aja and Idak with immense pleasure would like to present yet another spectacular episode of Master Speaks. Decoding Architect Kalhan Mattu in conversation with Architect Ramandeep Singh. Today's webinar is presented by Everest Industries. I hope this session is inspirational and motivational for all our viewers. Before we start the session, we would like to present a short AV and thereafter architect ramandeep will be taking the lead thank you you always start with a blank piece of paper the idea usually comes as a sudden spurt and once that clicks uh, i think we're all very excited it should give you goose flesh i think me architecture is really a discovery we are actually dealing with elements such as the wind sunlight rain shadow and creating spaces which you only imagine which you've actually never created before architecture is made up of materials so the choice of materials is obviously extremely important i think our discovery so to say of the fiber cement board which could be used uh was very fascinating the board itself allowed us to create a palette uh where we had this gray clay like surrounding and then we had little jewels of art juxtapositioned against this this very gray background I feel using prefab boards in a mechanical clamping way adds uh, to some kind of an insulation if it is used as a second skin on a building, and that also adds to save your air conditioning cost. Also, they are aesthetically very, very beautiful, especially the boards which have come now with textures of wood, stone, and other finishes. when you're using prefabricated boards and you're using so many of the prefabricated walls then specifically we talk about efficiency in terms of the fact that it's locally made and definitely something which is locally made is far more efficient the fact that a material which can be bought and come to site in literally 3 days can be cut and be used and be put up so quickly is something which is going to save you time cost wise it's extremely efficient so definitely using these materials plays a part in creating a sustainable structure we are doing one apmc market in latur uh, there the whole concept is that we are putting all the prefab structures all together as a semi lax if you develop it so it's supposed to be complete in 4 months time so we did uh, dna i mean one of our projects which we did the whole factory of 200000 square feet was completed in 2 and 3 months time and uh, including the press and everything uh, put together So there are so much of advantages of using the new things. We designed a building uh, in Delhi where we proposed a hollow column, hollow beam system. Uh, then using these uh, paneling systems to cover the whole um, structural and service framework. So even the flooring would be just stones and neoprene pads. So you can actually dismantle the whole building after its use and have as little, you know, ecological footprint in the area. So I think a prefab uh, methodology allows you to achieve that very easily. We're using this particular thing. We were able to reduce 30 mm sizes to uh, 19 mm sizes. We were able to reduce the structural costings of the facade. And I think that's very important in architecture that we we constantly question our work and we constantly evolve it. So uh, it's my pleasure to speak to someone here who is known for his inherent style and persona confident in everything whether it was college or nasa debates he went on to form a company that most won uh, that won most international awards uh, he won his first international award at the age of 29 stop shaking your head a complete <laughs> okay 
a complete charmer. I paid him for this. Sharp. I should. I took a lot of money for this. A complete charmer with a sharp mind, with a humor to match. We have been thus known to the world as the Kalan Matu, our very own Kalan. Oh good lord! Oh good lord! <laughs> Oh, this is this is was, phenomenally was, I, catastrophic. I, I, <laughs> I, I mean, they, they really had to convince me, Kalan, for this. Trust me, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for me also. Oh yeah, oh, well, it's good. You you can act really well. <laughs> you should have tried oh, acting. Yes. <laughs> uh, may I say my piece as well? Very short, if you allow me. Of course, please go ahead. It's your interview. <laughs> no, it's not mine. It's yours as well. <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you this. I'm giving you a chance to talk for a change. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Okay, so here's this lady who I always admired for her wit, wisdom, and beauty, and uh, uh, she obviously went on to better things in life. And this is the one of the only two women in my life who ever stood me up. So there you go. <laughs> Okay, I need to I need to know that story, but we just take it offline, okay? <laughs> no, 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 we'll do that later. <laughs> All right. So, okay, I just want to show some pictures, Kalan, from your college no. days. No, yes. No. Yes. No, no. Yes. No, 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 yes. no, no, no. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Okay, share screen. This is a torture, man. <laughs> what on earth? Really? I thought you would be kind. I am being too kind. You can just imagine how much they paid me for this. Oh, Lord, oh good Lord! I can't be good. Any nothing can be good from there. All no. Right. Oh, oh, Kalan, here you go. Lord. College it days. Be from Look, College days. It can't be Bombay. It can't be Bombay. Come on. Oh no no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. You no, you. No, no, no. <laughs> there are children watching this. They'll think it's okay to wear jackets. Polka polka dotted shirt. Oh, that's my friend. <laughs> Pradita, oh yeah, the scrawny little kid who lost 10 kgs in two months, by the way, Ramandi. Bombay had that effect on me. Oh, Ashish Anand, I love him. Yeah, that was Ashish Anand. And yeah, yeah, it's got to do. Oh, my work. Why are you showing my work? First year, right? First year. This is first year. Oh, that was good, actually. This I don't mind. Oh yeah. This is actually nice, Kalan. Oh, that's I a mean, school I did. Great pick. That's that's really a nice one. Where did you where did you dig this up? Oh wow, look at the elevations. They're better than what people do in fiftieth year. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this is a beachside villa. I remember this. Where did you find this? I um, dug it up. I, I have I my sources. I think your research thing is a bit creepy, actually. I have my sources. Yeah, I hope that's not. And there you go. No, <laughs> write my thesis. Well, which I flung. no, 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 get that off. Get that off. Hmm. Well, I do remember All what right. you said to that jacket picture. You know, that? That, you know who took that, by the way? Which one? Uh, the one with this leather jacket in, uh, you know, absolutely cold Mumbai. Kastub did that actually, and since it did make, it. A... <laughs> I'm guessing you <laughs> modelled for that picture. I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing you modelled for that picture with the black jacket. No, I was kind of uh, nonchalant. I was just looking sideways, and he captured me clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you find this stuff? Anyways, let's get beyond that. Well, and your voice is okay. This, this part was embarrassing. So uh, NASA tried everything. I mean, everything possible. I mean, change the rocket fuel, they change everything, and the rocket doesn't fire up. So huh. there goes the Sadar, Jalandar Singh. Huh. <laughs> he goes, <"Kaza> asa kar <laughs> What do you do? Kaza, I'll do it, I'll fix it. So Nasa says, This guy from India, how, what can he do? He said, what, what you do is that you tilt the rocket slightly. He said, How much? He said, 30 degrees. He said, Are you kidding? A huge rocket. Saturn five, I will tilt it 30 degrees. So they tilt to 30 degrees. So now you bring it to 15 degrees. <laughs> so they bring it back to 15 degrees. Okay. And he said, let me take it back to 30 degrees. She says, what on earth? So they do. <laughs> then they straighten it up. So, and then they fire the rocket and it goes up. So, wow, you're a genius. How did you do that? He said, I'm scooter. I'm going to go to Okay, 
our friends at uh, IDAC would not like this, but. <laughs> But, but you know, best part is Kalan, the best Sardar jokes come from the Sardar themselves. Of course, I know that. I, I know mean, that. my father has the best collection of Sardar jokes. I mean, they are actually funny. Me, <laughs> he's a very interesting guy, by the way. I remember from the lunch. But uh, let me ask you a I question. Where did Sardar ke bara bajne come from? Where did that come from? Okay, that's because they used to, okay, so they believed in guerrilla warfare, basically. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I know. I do know some things, right? History, and then they used to attack at twelve at night. Oh yes, that's right. Absolutely. On spot. My community should be proud of me for giving this answer. And that's and why they say Bara baje, Bara baje, they go mad. So that <laughs> <laughs> okay. So at night they would so. attack, and uh, Angad was probably the most ferocious of the gurus. Guru, Guru Angad. Yes. Huh? You Guru Gobind Singh. Guru you are the Kashmiri Sankar. Pandit. Really? You are the Kashmiri Pandit. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. Okay. <laughs> All right. So just, just to get you oriented. <laughs> you managed. God, thank God I knew the answers. <laughs> <laughs> you can check this out. I've got anyway, my dignity. Let's get back to what we are supposed I've to do. I've got my dignity intact. Okay. Okay. So back to this. Kashmir to Bombay. How did you come to JJ? First day of college. JJ memories, tell me all about it. So I came from Delhi and I had like two, three months in Delhi, which were pretty extraordinary. I was dating someone who was like way older. And that's one <laughs> time in my life I've done that. She was doing a master's in English. But that aside and staying in Bengali market, but I came to JJ because this, this seemed to be the only place where I should come. Do you want the origin story really where that thought came yes. into my mind? Yes. I know you would. Yes, yes. So, I was in 8th standard, which would make me about like 14, 15, whatever it might, I might have been. Huh. And late night cinema. So you remember this? You used to have movies late in the night. We are born the same age. Uh -huh. uh, you're much younger in looks, but that aside. Uh, so we used to have late night cinema on Do Darshan. And there it was in which Annie gives those ones. Oh, yes. And Arundhati Roy. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That fixation never went. <laughs> really? <laughs> Even now? Okay, go on. No, then it got contaminated with her political ideology. Huh. <laughs> so let's, I realized this deep truth that, <laughs> that um, what looks good is not necessarily the best. But um, no, I don't believe that <laughs> for the record. But um, I imagine that would be JJ College of Architecture. I was dumb. I was. That's why teenage brains are like not trusted. So I naturally assumed because only I had heard about JJ College of Architecture. Nobody told me there was an SPA. So uh, I got into a few like showing off North Indians. So I got into Hindu, St. Stephen, even Pilani, even a five-year course and all of that, which I hated. Uh -huh. But I got JJ and I said, wow, I'm going to finally live that completely liberal, out of the box life, which I wanted to do. <laughs> I don't reach Bombay, okay. along in the dad. So this is early morning. Um, and we come by Rajdhani and I'm looking out of the window. I can only see people on the side of the railway tracks. I said, what? I mean, what's happening here? I mean, I had imagined something better. Anyways, we reach JJ. The first person I meet is a Kashmiri. Kim Lakkol. <laughs> yes. Of you remember course. Her? I'll never forget her. Yes. All right. For the record, and whoever is hearing, Dimla Kohl was terror incarnate. People would like, literally, my apologies for the crude use of language, piss in their pants in this hall. But unfortunately, again, for her, that I didn't see her that way. I saw her as another Kashmiri woman. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I walk into the campus with my dad and I look up. And I said, oh, uh, good Lord. No, no, no. This is not the place. <laughs> I messed up big time. Where is uh, that Aram huh? Yeah. And then I walk in and Bimla Kul is sitting there. And I, the cocky me, I just, she said, welcome to JJ. I said, and it's good to have you here. I said, thank you so much. It's good that you also have me here or something like that. Oh, <laughs> and you know how random that is when it comes to JJ. 
and she gave me this stern look which kind of froze my spine but <laughs> for a moment and i then realized that okay my life was basically going to be crap from here on and it was <laughs> I mean, so we were just looking at all the pictures and your no, final no, year no. thesis, your final year thesis. Okay, so honestly, I mean, I remember looking at your project and we all found it so cool. It was super interesting. Not the professors, but all of how us. Do you spell so that actually, that I'm sorry, What's how that? do you spell that? Cool or cool? Okay, sorry, cool, you said, right. It cool. was, yeah, no, no. I mean, when, when I have to spell F O L, I'll, I'll be very clear about it. Trust me. For now, that was. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know very clearly. I won't be subtle about it. But yeah, it was very, very cool. And uh, yeah, but so how many people eventually took your thesis? We, I mean, we had four. I had four. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. How many. That's a story. That's a story. So okay, I must tell you this, and this is, uh, I sincerely hope my clients are not listening in right now. From my third to my tenth semester, I failed each and every <laughs> design um, class. What was that called? A design what? I mean, uh, design jury. Design, right? design, design student. Yeah. Design yeah, student. Jury. I failed yeah. each and every yeah. one of them, including the tenth semester, which was the thesis. Mm -hmm. And um, but I also managed to um, pass <laughs> the next kind of uh, semester, which was following it. Such that my father doesn't skin me alive. I mean, that was the basic uh, premise of, of making the effort later on to just get out. And I got on ten semester. Nobody knows the story. So it's quite fascinating that a college that really thought that I would be worthy of being, um, you know, put in the trash bin, actually has me here talking to them. What can I possibly tell students from JJ right now? I mean, this would be catastrophic to their interest, right? Wouldn't it be? You can do uh, some good. Do you want to know about the thesis, baby? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. First thesis, as um, <laughs> I have, so I had a lot of juice puff with no logic to it, and uh, I changed my thesis guide from Professor Vartak and to Professor Tungari, who I liked much, and okay. uh, clearly Vartak uh, did not take it well, <laughs> and Professor Vartak. When I came to the first thesis, he said, "What's your structure?" It was in the middle of the sea, by the way. I was probably at sea at that moment. So he said, "Why is it in the middle of sea?" I gave my whatever convoluted kind of answer, and he says, "Don't you think it will impact the environment?" I said, "Wow!" Oh. So it was in the middle of what's called the Queen's Necklace, and uh, okay. uh, clearly, I don't think I got the visual logic. Right, because I used to call it the, the pendant in the queen's necklace, but it was in the center. So weirdly so. And he said, uh, "Don't you think it'll damage the rocks?" I said, "Okay, I know I'm failing," <laughs> and I did fail. And then I put up another thesis, something that I would much rather not speak about. But uh, I got nine, nine invigilators uh, there. So which is like the the lineup of terror in J uh, in in JJ. <laughs> so I was like, I so one is coming in second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I said, okay, I'm had. I mean, this is done. But I managed to get out. The story in itself. You did. You did. I did. I, Thank yes, God. you definitely did. And you actually passed out, and uh, you pretty much started on your own after. You, I think you worked at. An office, and after Nobody that, you started enough. your. Nobody paid me enough. That's the and the one, and that's why you started your own planetary studios. Ah uh, well, 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 well. Uh, do okay, we have much before, time? Because we're just talking about origin story all the while. So no, but um, planetary studios okay. happened. <laughs> okay, planetary studios, and can you tell me about the most memorable memorable project? Not in terms of size. I mean, which which is your most Interesting and favorite project. I think um, so. I need to like. I need to skid back a little if you allow me. So mm -hmm. while I was doing my thesis, uh, you know, after my thesis was done, I kind of first thesis I went into doing an internship with somebody called F. A. Baker, and it turned out to be F. A. Baker, meaning um, I thought it was your 
or in firm. <laughs> My intellect is always limited. But it turned out to be a Bori and uh, at Nariman Point. And he gave me something to do and I finished the entire working drawings for one building, Abzar Tower, in one month's time. So he was kind of warm to me. Uh-huh. And I'm just a month and a half into the studio as an intern. Okay, so you understand then, it was very hierarchical. Okay. And it's this wow. large cabin with uh, leather upholstered sofas and the bells and whistles that come with that kind of a privilege. And I came to know that he was getting a project which was very large and he could not manage it on his own. Hmm. And look at my foolhardiness. I mean, <laughs> clearly the signs were right there then. So I walk into his cabin, I knock, I walk into his cabin, I say, would you allow me to do it? And he's taken aback. It, it's a 40 acre project somewhere in oh. Poland. He says, would you be able to do the entire design, all the elevations, elevations I can't render if you remember that, no. uh, do all the building models and the site model and all the floor plans by, your, by yourself? I said, absolutely, yes. <laughs> With no clue how to do it. I don't know what came over him. I'm sure he regretted it. No, he didn't. So he gave me that work and I started a studio while I was still an intern doing a 40 acre project. So it took me 10 years to get back to that. Now, where that cut back to collect plan three studios. I also need to mention the fact that um, <laughs> it's around 98 that the market tanked and I was bankrupt before I started. So that's a different story. Hmm. So as I come out, I am full of myself and wonder who that was. But um, I, I, I sincerely thought that I would make like a zillion bucks right away. Hmm. And I'm going around trying to broker deals and God knows what I was doing. It's embarrassing. I, and I meet someone who asked me what I was doing. It was related to me in another you know, far away way. But he asked me what I was doing. And I told him the six stories. But I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And he asked hmm. me a single line. He says, Haat mein kya hai? what do you have in hand? Hmm. I said, nothing. <laughs> So he gave me the exact opposite, the polar opposite of what my um, ego trip was. So he said, why don't you do a project for us, which is essentially um, 600 square feet or 650 square feet or something. No, yeah, 600 to 650 square feet. So he said, why don't you just um, do this for us in 20 days time? And we're talking about a time when everything, Thing used to be built by hand, not much has changed, but still. Uh, so everything used to be built by hand. And I, even my you know, advanced teenage brain realized that it was kind of not possible. Uh, it's just 20 days. And I said, what's the budget? I was hoping that it would say like 5, 10 lakh rupees, whatever. So he says, a lakh and 25. I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. And then, just to put a pin on it, he said, you need to fit in 42 people in there. Okay, now I am about to walk away from this cat. Oh. And he kind of asked me to sit down. He said, no, just hang on, think about it. I say, it's not possible. I'm an architect. I know it's, you can't fit in so many people like sardines. So he said, just give it a try. So I said, budget is wrong. Time is wrong. Everything is wrong. I call up a few contractors. They say, it's not possible. But then something struck me. And he walked out. Uh, and we walked into Abdul Rahman Street, that entire area. Yeah. And I got... The prices of everything, kila, screw, uh-huh. uh, fevicol, thickness of ply, weight of ply, and how you can kind of hack this, hack that, and all of that. We did a day of just checking. When we came back, we realized that we could make money in this and probably do it as well. So okay. we finished in 18 days time, we slept on site one day. Uh, well, that's a good origin story, but the fact was the Mumbai flooded that night. But we slept on site that night. And um, within 18 days' time, we made 37,000 rupees out of it. That is incredible. Uh, that's a better, better ending that to the story. Incredible. 10 years later, okay. so it was uh-huh. an RPG group, somebody, we go photocopiers, and 10 years later, uh-huh. we ended up doing the entire RPG headquarters with Harsh Goen. Nice story. That's right. amazing. That is incredible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting. Let me, let, me do, let me show everyone some of. Some of your projects here. Which projects? Hold on. Okay, so this is uh, Vidya Lanka, Kalan. Oh, wow, yes. College, yes. 
All right. So this is a very interesting project. It actually got us a lot of um, accolades and people came to know about us. I have some clue, yes, why? Because my client was as naive as I was. So we were up against some of the biggest architects in the country and I give it to the client and he still remains a client. We did six projects with him ever since. It's amazing. Wow. What a story. So, and we also left this project before it got over. This is what I never tell anyone. Four or five months before it got over, I just left. I got frustrated. It was not going my way. Um, so this was very early. So we made an educational institution when we had built absolutely nothing before. Meaning a lot of a toilet block. Forget doing a two lakh square project. And, and we did this and it was a bloody extraordinary experience. I'm telling you that there, uh, I was not satisfied. I never am. But um, now I see the value of what we managed to do that time. It was extraordinary. This won the... This went to the World Architecture Festival, one of the first Indian entries ever. This won the Design Share Award. It, it did a lot for us. It was this probably the most recognizable first project that we had. It is. It was our first project, but it's probably one of our most recognizable, recognizable projects ever. Interesting. So this was something that we did later, which is called X-Block. So we went a bit berserk with this one. We brought in those, which was supposed to be biosciences extension. So we went a bit crazy with all these, um, I don't even know what this is, flora, flora uh, interpreted in different ways. But it was interesting. The kids loved it. So this is the thing. Yeah. Um, none of our projects actually look similar to each other. So the reason for that is because your end users are always different. I don't want to get too cerebral about it, but that's the truth of it. I love this project. All right. Okay. So this one is, let me find this. So this one is Seahorse. And don't ask me why. So this was Mills and Perel that we completely, uh, <laughs> we went with a broad brush and went all over these mills because they were supposed to kind of display building products coming from China. And the client thought that seahorse is a water creature. So that's why uh -huh. it comes across the ocean. Okay. Sorry. Ah, my favorite tragedy. <laughs> Elaborate, yes. Oh, well, painfully. Um, so this is out-of-box workstation. Uh, there was a competition by Godrich where they wanted us to reimagine the modern workstation. So we created this thing which kind of packs and then opens up into a fully functioning two workstations on either side. We were supposed to get royalty, not seen a dime, which is it's safe to assume that didn't sell many uh, because it was priced a bit too high. So this made us realize that product design is probably a game that one must really learn bottom up. Okay. It also, by the way, one, uh, the best product design in terms of furniture, uh, Get the name of that competition, but also went to, or we were invited to send this to the Newburger Museum of Art in New York. And so it went there for three months as a prototype display. Prototype. Oh, that's Quite amazing. fun. We went there. <laughs> amazing. amazing. No, it's okay. From far. Yeah. So we did a <laughs> bunch of hospitality spaces. Must I say this? So, no, no, go back. I must go back. Ah, sorry. Yeah. This is just one of five, six that we did. So we started our careers with um, a project that was too small for anyone to even consider. Soon we went on to doing the biggest dance bar in the country, in, in Bangalore. And the dance bar was a phenomenal experience. And uh, it's called Night Lovers, which is something that was there in Mumbai. So they're pretty direct. Yes, yes. <laughs> And soon we followed that up with another one, which was called Lover's Night. I mean, apparently they run out of words when it comes to dance bar. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I thought for a moment that my career was destined to do dance bars only. <laughs> soon after we got Vidya Lankar and, and people didn't know what, the, what on earth we were doing. So this is a bunch of hospitality projects that we did, which got us a lot of awards and made us kind of known around. This was done way back, probably 2001 or 2002, whatever it was. But we did the entire drawings for this complex thing and built it up in steel. It's quite, it was phenomenal as an experience. 
multiple such projects. So hospitality became a forte for a bit. All right. right. Wow. This is lovely. Wow, we straight yeah. cut so many generations and get to Clarion. All right. So Clarion is, we did a lot of projects in, in offices and this was the point at which we kind of exited out of very large scale uh, corporate projects. This was one lakh square feet and it won us the best uh, corporate office of the year award with uh, IAM. So it was quite nice actually. Even with the Lankar won the IAM award. So it's quite nice. Baya. <laughs> oh, my favorite. Um, uh, it was kind of a quasi retail space where why am I explaining all this? But the developer is a new developer and he wanted to call his brand Baya and we made this Baya's Nest. Oh, okay. that is. I was, was about to ask what that was. Yeah. Yeah, that's a Baya's Nest. So it huh. is something that I always speak about us kind of sinking in with the brand identity and kind of communicating it or fortifying it with our ideas. So this came on design. It went to a lot of places. It was fun to do though. Ah, oh, this one's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's quite a random mix of projects. Um, so this is the time that we started doing what we call IPD projects. So we took the mandate of doing projects completely end to end. So this is, can I dwell on this please? Yes, yeah. please go on. Of course. <laughs> no, I don't know the time constraints. So. Um, Mumbai has this extraordinary situation where the entire Eastern coast is owned by the biggest landowner in Mumbai, which is Mumbai Port Trust. Hmm. And Mumbai Port Trust has some 1800 acres of land. And at the tip of that land towards Ballot Bear is this cruise terminal, not this, but what exists right now, which is indistinguishable from the multiple kind of warehouses that exists in that area dead. Uh, I have known people who came by a cruise ship to Mumbai, uh, foreigners who did not disembark because they simply saw the cruise terminal and thought they were getting into some, God knows, maybe Somali pirates would take them over or what would happen to them. Uh, it's, it's a, it's an extraordinary st story of neglect of how we neglect our, um, you know, the first appearances that we make for our country which used to be for airports and well as well, which changed, thankfully. So here we saw this project and uh, so we the lead consultants for this. This was the beginning of our IPD portfolio. So inter integrated project delivery, where we do everything end to end. So everything from traffic studies to marine engineering, to actual structural engineering, MEP, um, master planning, architecture design, project management, and oh God, that's a long list, uh, even the PPP tender, which we initiated mm -hmm. such that from a 62 crore or 60 odd crore rupee project, we made this into a 400 crore project. We opened a port in India to public for the first time. Imagine all of Bombay cannot access the Eastern seaside just because there are laws with the shipping industry, with the shipping ministry, such that they prohibit you to access it. These are colonial laws. I mean, uh, it's extraordinary that we are still holding on to them. So this is the first project basis which SOPs were drawn for future opening of ports in India. And here, our contribution was multifold, but most importantly, we managed to support the government uh, mm -hmm. and the state government was involved to an extent, but primarily MBPT to get uh, funding from the Ministry of Tourism, uh, Government of India, to the extent of 100 crores and also 200 crores PPP kind of uh, investment, which we did through a complete business plan that we created for this project. So that opened up the whole understanding and avenues for, for, for appreciating a project holistically from the program draws from the requirements that are at core of a project like this. Uh, requirements that could be uh, financially sustainable and um, that would uh, actually pay for itself rather than putting the uh, 
the, the pressure of infrastructure development on the government. It's at an extraordinary location, but surprisingly, how we do things that we do not realize the value of, uh, we're not able to monetize, I would say, the value of these jewels that we own as a public uh, kind of, a, which are held in public trust. So first of those projects and uh, an extraordinary experience. And as I moved away from Planty Studios, uh, this was going full speed. Ah, ah right. So this is fun by my heart. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's up in the hills, uh, actually Himalayas. So very close to where I grew up in Kashmir, but it's not exactly Kashmir. It's more on the Jammu side, but so this is a ropeway that connects two places. One place is very known, Patni Top, and mm. I understand, Ramandeep, you've been there. Price. And I've been the there nice twice. Side. Yeah. So, um, so this place, um, Patni Top is a hill station and it connects with a village down called Sangot, which is on the highway. Huh. It saves us 30 kilometers of drive on hills. That's a lot of time. So, and also, uh, you need to pop pills to get there. Um, it took about 20 years to get the permissions for this one. Not my job. Wow. Like, okay. No, the government fought for it. And when the Supreme Court gave the permission, environment clearance, they said you cannot cut more than 10 trees in the entire length, which is about 3.2 or 3.3 kilometers, which is what it is. Obviously, it didn't make sense. I mean, because, uh, you know, 10 trees is nothing. I mean, you probably have to uh. kill like 100 trees to get there maybe more pines actually. So we ended up making or building the tallest rope in India. So each, each of the pylons is 60 meters tall. So that's wow. one extraordinary thing. The second extraordinary thing, actually that should be the first, is the fact that we managed to functionally start the ropeway 18 months from the time we were on site. It, I mean, the the gondolas are moving 18 months time. And this is a 3S technology, which is a leading technology anywhere for ropeways. And uh, for me personally, what made this extraordinary is, is something that I believe in very strongly. I believe that we must carry on memories of who we are, where we come from and what we do. And also that apparently in architect speak becomes contextual design, but I'll say just simply say memories, but those memories need reinterpretation, retelling, the stories need retelling. So here it is. It's your typical uh, sloping roof configuration over a one lakh square feet timber building, which is extraordinary. By the way, there are no clear bylaws to or uh, building regulations to, to support you there. And one has to go by judgment of what one does and, outside regulations. So it was a very extraordinary experience, but the whole interpretation was very contemporary, yet keeping a continuity for those who visit this place. So for me, that was kind of important. Yeah. I have another story, if you allow me. We, yes, we used about 1.3 million single stones from the site itself to build this thing uh, up to a ground level, which means uh, which means embankments, which means retaining walls, which means even the walls that are built for the buildings. And uh, they came way cheaper than brick. And wow. it was extraordinary. We were able to do dressed stone masonry cheaper than brick over there. And it's simply found materials on the site. And so is the wood, by the way. It's very responsibly sourced. And um, so for me, this was what I call a transitional kind of style or a transitional thought project. I hope there are more that happen around because um, like I say, every uh, design thinking, every engineering kind of input has to be in sync with the time. We cannot do a prestige of the old or we cannot simply plonk something that comes from somewhere else and has no relation or, or connection with the local context. So for me, this is this this project to me has a soul. Rest others can judge for their own. It's functional. I have a, I have a reason to go back to Patni Top. 
Kalan. Oh, you absolutely have. <laughs> I've gone there thrice, so this will be my fourth time. Uh, you must right. also discount the fact that visualizations look better than what really happens, but such is India. We tried our best. The client was very, very supportive in this whole process. Are we done with my work? Can we talk something? Kalan, you have always been very innovative in design and technology. All right. And um, so, um, I mean, regarding, I mean, I mean, I've heard a lot about, uh, you know, when you discuss the architectural community, and uh, how we how to quite an extent we haven't really evolved we are uh, uh, we see everything from a very very probably singular point of view but there's a lot more that we can actually do and you have actually gone ahead and done a lot first of all you've gone international you have offices in vietnam thailand malaysia oh, no, india no, no, of no. course have i have i missed anything have i missed any no that's enough that's enough Okay, so I would like to talk about DI now. Ah, something yeah. I like. Right. Yeah. So, I'll say this. Um, most people know me for the rather flamboyant design intensive kind of projects that we do. Hmm. But I always thought that we are stuck in what I call a boutique mentality. Where we do a one-off project, don't make enough money. But we're pretty excited that we did something where visualizations came out exciting. People like it. It's so easy to get published. It's so easy to get awarded. You know, almost in my sleep, I got some 60 odd awards. And frankly, I lost interest finally because I knew it was nonsense. I mean, it was just you know, no offense to all those wonderful people who gave me awards, but I knew that it was undeserved for the fact that we were not doing what we were supposed to be doing, which is actually changing lives for better around. So one-off project doesn't do it. The problem here is, um, it's twofold. One is, we are too obsessed with, with doing the next awesome thing, which, would, which is called a bizarreness effect, that we, that we kind of forget what the real client needs are. And that's why we probably get paid the way we do. So how that all connects with DI is the following. I did a few developer projects. And I realized that developers and us and I, in some sense, were talking completely different languages. I think slightly more <laughs> clued in. Uh, I did manage to kind of sidestep those kind of traps, but I realized that we are fundamentally not uh, equipped with uh, the tools and tackles for us to actually service developers' needs. Worse, we are actually not even empathetic to those needs. We actually dismiss them with some intellectual kind of, I don't know, intellectual. It's some idealistic, ideological kind of uh, arrogance, which I find random completely. So I realized that while I could not necessarily service the developer's needs in the, in the way they wanted in terms of design, but I realized that their requirements really were about ensuring that the project sells, the project is attractive to the customers who come to buy it. It also functions well for, for those who have to maintain it. Very, very basic architectural stuff. And none of the developers actually trust, trusted the architects. They would get architects only, uh, again, it'll sound crude, but almost to do like, uh, item numbers in a movie. You get a foreign mm -hmm. architect, the name is big, you do a little show and tell, and then you're gone. So, and I just dug a bit deeper, I realized dev developers were clueless, absolutely clueless. So there is this, this paradigm of thinking, uh, I think it comes from success. That if you're successful at something, you think that same success gives you this God-given uh, uh, understanding that is so unique about the entire world. So developers are as much to blame and they, they had what I call the golden gut syndrome that, you know, this guy is doing in 350, I in 325 and that's great. But neither of, the, of them had done the math right. Mm. So what we did was that we, we combined architecture with engineering, with 
intuitive and uh, functional understanding of project delivery along with further understanding how investments and finance happen in the project and how different kind of investors exit out of the project. Now, this all we did upfront. There is no architect who will give you a span of a room based on the cut length of a steel. We are those guys who do that in DI. And why can I make these kind of tall claims? Because we've done GI in multiple ways already. We done it with uh, one of the biggest developers in India, names never taken. And we proved it to them that their project that was done at 1450 rupees a square foot would clearly be possible in 1175 rupees a square foot had that they done the following, which was completely common sense. But each and every time DI walks into a room, it has there are two things that you can expect. One, you will get money from us. So this is completely, it's again a paradigm shift in thinking. DI promises you money. That whatever we do will optimize, we will improve, we will make it more efficient. So our fees is always a minuscule portion of what we offer to you. And how do we evidence that? With stat models, with all the, all the, evidential ways in which science works. But very importantly, the combination of design and engineering upfront is something that no one else does. Some of the biggest consulting companies cannot do. We do. So we did this for a big developer uh, in a housing project. We did this for an IT company that wanted to do the IT building and they had this vision they wanted round plus 13. We proved that round plus 11 was the best. Long stories. But uh, then we also did, I find the most interesting, which is comparative analysis. That you've done something and we come in hmm. head to head. So hmm. it's very competitive and it's fun to do. And it also allows us to acquire greater value for the for the service that you offer. 2.5 million square feet project in Ranji. First meeting, we say, here's your footprint of the plan. And we have made this little better instead, just subjective. But beyond that, we say, we have done something for you, which was extra. Look, what we did in the plan improvement was subjective. So that's the problem with architecture and design. We only have subjective um, solutions to offer. People have opinions about them. But we did something else. We said, we have reduced the perimeter length of your basic module. The saleable area is the same. By this much percentage. And because of the saving on masonry, plastering, uh, painting, uh, weight on the structure, and forget the life cycle cost. Currently, in the CapEx, we have saved you 7.2 crores, and that's your Mithaigat apartment. So there you go. Free of cost here to you. No, you cannot argue with that. Because that is something engineering will substantiate. So our claims are substantiated by algorithms, and we are developing those on our own. The last kind of BI is what I call value engineering. A very big, yeah. uh, tall tower in Mumbai with a very big brand. We kept the intent the same. We kept um, uh, we get the look and the feel the same as the facade design I had suggested. And this is advanced engineering. So detail against detail, detail against detail. We did mm -hmm. our version of it. We saved them ten crore rupees on the facade, and we got ten percent. All of the I happens in forty five days whatever the scale of the problem, which is phenomenal. Last thing I'll say on this. I know I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm indulging since you said you were interested, even if others are not. Um, GI happens before even design process technically starts. So it's like front end engineering and design, only that our our offer to you is at the level of a schematic level design. So you get all the floor plans, you get everything. And all of that, all of that is, so you get floor plans, yes. uh, you get schematic level designs, you get everything uh, such that you can actually build from that. And none of this is just theory. So at the end of the Ranchi project, we saved them 58 crore rupees of investment. Clear. Wow. 
We wow. give them 34 additional units to sell on that same land area. Hmm. And uh, we saved them um, in terms of investment. That's a whole story by itself, how we made the exit plan. Uh, GI is, is the way the future is going to be. I think architects are living in our own ivory, ivory towers, not really engaging with this engineers and the uh, ones who actually produce our uh, spaces and buildings because of the artificial separation that we have inherited. I don't believe in that. I never did. And thankfully, we have something to show. You know, when I listen to you, I just, I, I mean, the thought just keeps running in my mind that we really under us, undersell ourselves. Actually, architects, we have the power and ability and capability to change the society. We just don't utilize it. Public spaces, how we plan houses, how we plan residences. I mean, it just changes the social structure. And I don't think we realize to the, ex the extent to which we can change all that. So, okay, so that's another topic altogether. But without, losing the <laughs> without losing the plot, okay, DXP is another very interesting oh my God. Uh, venture you've gone into. That I'd love wrong. to hear about DXP. Yeah, please go on about DXP. Let's, okay, so I mean, there is, okay. No, yeah. listen. Um, so all of the things that I'm speaking about, I'm speaking based on some work done. So I would, okay. you know, much as I would love to chatter about things, but it's better that you substantiate your claims with something done. Uh, so I've done about 100 design and build projects in my career. Most people don't, would not know about it because they only look at the pretty sexy designs that they see. But they don't realize that from the very first project that I mentioned, which was doing that, um, 600 square feet project, I realized that I had the ability, intuitive ability to understand things at a very base level as well. And it's important. So as we went forward, we did 100 odd design and build projects over time and that cross subsidized everything that we did. So we could flamboyantly do our design and not get paid for them, which is a problem always. Yeah. And in doing that, I realized there was structural flaw really in how we did that although we had challenges that we met extraordinarily but every time it was firefighting and why so basically three things first we lack skilled manpower and extension to that as you know well any any kind of mechanization and tools with that so yes, we have people true. who are unskilled who are to give vision to what you have created and the expectations are from a client who is generally very well versed with the ways of the world and here is this guy who comes in half a shot and he has no clue what he has to do right and you cannot fix that problem <laughs> because we have got under trap we're paying them less and they're not they have no motivation to do that the government gives them a manega skin they run away so that's it that's the story yeah. so generally i say this uh, to a lot of people and nobody disagrees on this. We've come to the conclusion that we can get only two of the three things right. Cost, quality, time. Okay. Which I think is hmm. pathetic. Imagine if you were building cars like that. I mean, <laughs> none of this would work anywhere other than our industry which is so behind the curve. So I realized first is a skill issue. Second is literally doing everything on site. Look, it's reduced over time but since we end again this trap that we build buildings so poorly that we have to fix them in the interiors in the, in the cement and the screed that we have to put and the toilets and oh god the story is painful so i realized that as long as poor labor is has to do a lot of work on site it'll never be done so it means you'll always have have dissatisfied clients the third thing i realized was that we have got into a downward spiral since we handed over the patent to the PMCs. Good friends there. Uh, but uh, PMCs see this entire process in a commodified way. They outbid each other on price with no clue how to fix the basic system. I say this very emphatically. It's not that the price is going down is an issue. I mean, I can, no, not this one, but I can pro possibly <laughs> buy a t-shirt at a price my father would find unimaginable right now because yeah. modification actually reduces 
costs. It yeah. uh, volumes in, uh, increase, increase efficiency. But that never came to us. So here we are, where we have a downward spiral in which the costs are going down. The expectations of in terms of time are going up. So what was normally done in three months to be done in like 45 days, expected to be done in a month. And with uh, and at a cost which is a fraction of what it used to be before, and quality suffers clearly. I mean, whoever got a project which was right on all three, never, no one. Bold claim, but I would really like to challenge someone. So I realized that we cannot get it all right. So the second insight was get it done off site. Third insight was why do we pay what we do for those products and services that we get? Because there are layers and layers and layers of markups that we put in. It's a stack that happens. It'll astound you to know. Actually, you don't. Uh, so some of the better brands pay as much as 60%. The price that you pay is almost 60% goes to the dealer. So while he's yeah. giving you a 30% discount and you're astounded that he's able to do that, he already has a 30% markup built into it. So the share that you're buying is for a lack of fees, but actually it ought to have been like 30, 35,000 rupees. I think that's a structurally flawed system. Yes, you can do things cheaper, but you need to do them right. It does not that's mean that you push you push the tragedy down to the last uh, person standing on site, which is the, the, the subcontract, which is what happens. Currently. So we did this. Uh, we, through our offices, and you rightly pointed out in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Malaysia, we actually reached out to some 200 factories, and I stopped doing interiors about two and a half, three years back, and we just collected information in BIM. If not BIM, we made them BIM. So we had information rich models, hmm. active intelligence about their fits and finishes in those factories themselves, active intelligence about the logistics of supply from those factories, their production capabilities, all of that. We did map this over a year and a half to two years. And that database became the basis of how we do DXP projects now. Incredible. So what does that do? That does this. So I this should have been another one actually. <laughs> so that does this. If you're a client, you come to me, um, I wish to create a parametric uh, or a computational design tool to do the floor plans very quickly. I think that's a waste of time generally. People indulge that for no reason. Uh, but the floor plans that we create are from the modules from these particular factories. And the choice of that factory depends on what you like, the price that you want to you know, pay for it. We yeah. will always give you a better price because we become channel partners. So it is a marketplace that connects with an actual requirement of a customer such that you'll be able to get a better, much better price. You're also able to get instantaneous renderings in 3D and experience in 3D. I'm not saying only VR. You can see it on a laptop. But the modules are real and the modules cost the best because you are not customizing it. So it's a bottom up approach as opposed to typically what architects have this huge uh, top down approach, which is symptomatic of our problems. <laughs> we look down on everything. Mm -hmm. So it's a bottom up approach, which uses the module to create the final product. So our current capability based on the four projects, five projects we've done is to reach about 90% of all build in an interior site spanning from a office to a uh, you know, lab to retail space is that we can do up to 90% currently offsite and which reduces also your lease rental time that you get free then you can negotiate better for yourself yep. so give me a plan and I'll get it done quicker so we did about these four five projects in the beginning hmm. we saved the clients in the least attractive scenario about 18 percent on the cost and this is without scale we've still not gone big uh, as we go bigger we'll get it cheaper we saved them we made a okay so let me put it this way we had a 20 same to same kind of project comparison am i getting too much into detail go on no so same to same project kind of comparison so one way to judge quality is what we call uh the snag list so snag number of yeah. items in a snag 
list. The first yeah. one was 20, was 20 items. The next same scale project, we got three items. So it's that much improvement in quality, substantiated right there. And the on-site and total project time reduced by, I think, 35%, including wow. design time. So look, That's the amazing. thing is this, as you, since the models are information rich, as you pick something, the cost counter changes live. All right. So you can tell if you're making the right decisions for a project. I'm guessing, I that's a, I'm guessing that's a massive database that you've got out there. Yeah, but it has massive. to reach about 500 factories. And now that China and all this is not accessible, now we have to start with India again. <laughs> so, so coming to that, Kalan, COVID, what have you been doing? I, I mean, Netflix, Netflix, I was just going to say that, Netflix. <laughs> Netflix, so, okay, so, Prime. Yeah. So, so and, just tell uh, me, so... Um, should I tell you uh, the shows? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think we will discuss that. <laughs> but do you, do you really think that it's going to be a very different world after, uh, I mean, eventually this is going to get over and things are going to uh, go back to pre-COVID times. So we, you know, we're talking about healing this planet and things are going to change. Do you think this is going to happen or it's going to be just going to be go back to square one because human memory is really short? Do you think there's any <laughs> scope of improvement in human nature? No, human nature is a big one. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. look at the, the doable stuff or what's yeah. going to be realistically there. Yeah. Look, I, right. I, I cannot make those claims because like I've always said, it takes brave people to make bold claims about the future. I have no clue. But I can do one thing. Um, I can look at history. So usually, as they say, you know, those who disregard history are, you know, so, well, you know that. So uh, I can look at history uh, and, and probably look at similar circumstances that us as humanity have faced before and we have faced worse, frankly. I mean, from the plague, the black plague, to the Spanish flu, to God knows how many, the famines that we've gone through. There's one thing that comes out consistently in all of that study. Not a deep one, I'm shallow. But the study suggests that each, each and every instance, then each and every instance, we as humans tend to have paradigm shifts. Yeah. You know, the world conquering the Europeans came out right after the Black Plague because literally the resources and people died out. Uh, economics changes direct, uh, uh, drastically. Um, the way people behave. Uh, industrial revolution gets was activated as a result of the multiple such things that happen uh, in such places. The point is this, I don't think it will leave no footprint. It will leave and not just a footprint, a huge imprint on our society. We were already heading towards what I call at distance socializing, which was amazing. I'm more social than I ever was. My uncle in the US, who I never met for 10 years. Now I know what he's drinking in the evening and what he's doing. It's amazing. Yeah. But yeah. so actually we got more connected as opposed to what people think that they were disconnected in this world. So I think we will probably just uh, take it, uh, sounds funny, but as a new normal. And there might be new things that come up. Uh, a lot of meetings that we do, by the way, are useless. You don't know that. Right? We just need to... <laughs> I would much rather spend that time socializing with people. It was amazing talking to you. And it's actually, amazing can... that you indulged me this long. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm really pay they paid me well for this. Oh, but it uh, was great. It was great fun talking to you, pleasure. Kalan. All the best for all your future endeavors. More awards to you. And I'm waiting for the first billion that you're going to make. Oh, good Lord. That's <laughs> so much pressure. Less I is, am kind of okay, so le less, less is more, that's just not for you. So, no. waiting, waiting for the first billion. More is more. We, we're going to celebrate that over a glass of wine, for sure. And you should buy that. <laughs> Done! <laughs> I, can, I can afford that much. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I will. <laughs> All right, Colin. Thank, Thank you so much so for indulging me. Thank you Thank so much. You so much. Thanks. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye.
been to. Bye.